Hi there, everyone. Um, welcome to my home on what is for me Sunday morning. One of my favorite things to do on Sunday morning <clears throat> is to just sit around leisurely and drink tea. I love tea. But I've really enjoyed this, um, this recent habit of spending my Sunday mornings with you and chatting with you. <clears throat> it's been a lot of fun and a lot of you watch, <clears throat> I'm sorry, many of you watched my videos from last week. Oh, and my, my team are telling me that I'm getting lots of beautiful emojis. So here you go, right back at you guys. My hearts and smileys, everything right back at you. So last week I spoke about a story <clears throat> that where I had an experience when my parents took me to see a guru um, because they were having trouble getting me married, which is a normal thing that happens in my culture, especially back then <clears throat> in the 80s when my parents were trying to groom me for marriage. And this sparked um, a conversation amongst people about gurus. What's a good guru? What's a bad guru? So first of all, I want to say <clears throat> that my experience that I had I wasn't a blanket statement about gurus, so I want to be really clear about that because I know many of you have gurus who you love and who have helped you. And so I want to make sure you understand that what I'm saying here absolutely does not dismiss what they do because it is so important and it is so needed in the world right now for gurus to help people and help people see themselves and be loved and be of service and help the planet. That is so important. So I want you to know, know that. So I'm going to start by saying, how would I determine whether I feel that a guru resonates or doesn't resonate? Knowing what I know today, if I was speaking to the person I was then, that person who went to see the guru, who was impacted in that way. And for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, um, please check out my video from last week, my Facebook Live from last week. It might even be uploaded on YouTube by now. But um, it's, it's dated from one week ago. I think it's around February the 20th or something like that. And, and I speak about my experience of my parents taking me to see a guru and how the guru made me feel that I was fundamentally flawed, that there is something wrong with me, that I was spoiled and I needed to change, and I needed to do a lot in terms of changing and doing rituals and things like that in order to be worthy of nirvana, which is um, similar to like in order, it's similar to saying, in order to be worthy of entering into heaven. So, um, and so this made me feel really, really fearful. It made me dim my light and so on. So um, I want you to go back and watch that video if you haven't. So how do you determine whether a guru is serving you or not, or, or setting you back? Um, and that's the conversation that sparked since I had that, did that last video. So if I was speaking <clears throat> to that little girl, that young girl that I was, I would actually be telling her, knowing what I know today, I would be saying to her that if a guru sets you free, free from fear, if a guru makes you feel big and liberated and tells you that you need to shine your light, then that guru is good for you. But if the guru makes you feel shackled, or as guru or spiritual teacher or anybody, if they make you feel that you're not good enough, you need to do more, you need to be more, you need to work harder, try harder, that you, um, you need more dogma and doctrines in your life, that you're flawed, that you won't get to heaven, and that you can't do it without them, that's the worst one, that you can't do it without them, then if, if I was speaking to that girl I used to be, I would say, then that guru is not serving you. Because here's the thing, I know that there are a lot of people in the world who are maybe narcissistic or who are completely self-serving, not the gurus, I'm talking about people that need messages like that, that they need to do good in the world, they need to be of service and all that. There are a lot of people in the world like that. I mean, 
Right now, we need more compassion and empathy and so on more than ever. We need to be nice more than ever. But what I noticed, and again, this is my experience, what I noticed as a young girl was that when I would go to these spiritual teachings, when I would go see these um, gurus, the people who were attracted to such teachings, to such classes, to such books, the people who were attracted to them were not those people who were out there being narcissistic or bullying or killing. They were not attracted to such teachings or gurus or teachers. They were the ones getting on with um, going on their power trip or taking over the world or doing whatever they were doing. The ones who were attracted to these teachings were the ones who were either more sensitive or more empathic or more introverted. They were the ones who were attracted to these kinds of teachings and spiritual teachings. And so people used to go to connect with like-minded people. And I sometimes say it's a darn good thing that I'm not a spiritual guru because if I was, knowing that I'm talking to people like that girl I used to be, my message would run completely counter to many of the conventional spiritual teachings. It would run completely counter and I'm sure I would not be accepted in spiritual circles because what I would be telling the people that were in front of me was I would be saying, you guys need to own your power. You guys are already sensitive and sympathetic and introverted. But, and you guys are already squashing your ego and suppressing it. So I'm not going to tell you to do that. You guys are already performing acts of kindness to everybody to the point where you're draining yourselves. So I'm not going to tell you to be of service to everyone. I'm going to tell you that you need to shine your light. You need to own your power. You need to be all that you can be. You need to express yourself. You need to shine your light as bright as you can because the brighter you shine, the more that you will be helping other people with your light because darkness doesn't help other people. You need to love yourself so much and embrace your own ego so that you're unafraid to shine that light of kindness and service and everything that you already are. It's about embracing who you are. It's about being who you are. And if people say to me, um, that what I'm teaching is wrong. I need to give people more instructions because people often say to me, um, I want tenets, I want instructions, I want to know step by step, what do I do to be more spiritual? I want to be more spiritual. That's how I used to be. I used to constantly try and work harder to be more spiritual because I was led to believe that we are fundamentally flawed and we need to work at being more spiritual. I would tell you, you already are spiritual. You already are spiritual. How can you not be? You come from spirit and you go back to spirit. The, the flaw is the fact that you've been led to believe that you need to spend your life working on yourself to become more spiritual. That in itself sends you the message that there's something wrong with me, that, um, that I've been <clears throat> forsaken. That already is sending you the wrong message. I would be telling you that you already are spiritual. You just have to allow who you are to shine through. To love yourself is the same as loving God because you are an expression of God. You see, the thing is, um, I, um, I had to die. And those of you who don't know my backstory, I had end stage cancer. I had end stage cancer and was in a coma and crossed over into the other realm. Doctors had told my family that I had died. Basically, my organs had shut down and I had died and I wasn't coming back. But when I was in the other realm, I realized it wasn't my time. And I realized I had to come back. And when I came back, my physical body experienced a healing, a, a spontaneous healing. And what I realized in the other realm was that everything I had learned up to that point was the opposite of what I needed to know to actually make my life work. I'd always learned that I needed to work harder at being more spiritual and at making myself more perfect for the afterlife. 
what I realized when I was in the afterlife, when I was in the other realm, was that actually this life is so precious and valuable. So in other words, death taught me that life is a gift and I need to value my life and I need to find my joy and I need to realize that we are spiritual beings, but we've come here to immerse ourselves in a human experience, in a physical experience. And my only work is really to be who I am, embrace who I am, and to find my joy and to follow my passion. So when people ask me, how can I be more spiritual? I tell them the only way to, as far as I'm concerned, if you want to be more spiritual, find your joy, be who you are, dance to Dancing Queen, eat chocolate, eat more chocolate. And that's why I say it's a darn good thing I'm not a spiritual guru. And so I, oh, by the way, if you have any questions about this subject or other subjects, please post your questions. I have a couple of people behind the scenes, including my husband and even the editor of my next book. She's here as well. Her name is Deborah. And um, they're going uh, to pick some questions and they're going to ask me. So please, please ask questions. And also, um, I want to pivot now to another topic, which I thought was really, really interesting. And I had a letter from somebody this week. Somebody wrote in and actually said, um, you know, because in the last couple of weeks, I've been talking about being super sensitive, being empathic. And so this person wrote in and said, they watched my video about the trials of being a young empath, who somebody who just wanted to express herself, but we are impacted by the broadcast emotions uh, and expectations of others. Now this is the thing that empaths and sensitive people find, is that they are really impacted by the emotions of the people around them, and sometimes that's what prevents them from expressing themselves. However, this person who wrote in says that they are on the other end of the spectrum, of the empath spectrum. So if you have empath and super sensitive people who have very thin skin and no boundaries on one end of the spectrum, on the other end of the spectrum, you've got people with really strong boundaries who are really able to keep the world out. And there's a term for it, a clinical term, which is Asperger's. And why I found this person's letter really interesting is because the person describes themselves as becoming an odd duck at school, a nerd, a dork, and they could barely comprehend. Like basically what happens is when you're closed in, when your boundaries are too strong, then you don't understand or you don't perceive the social cues of the people around you. The sensitive people over perceive it. It's like overwhelming. Other people's sensations are overwhelming. But for the people who have Asperger's, the other end of the spectrum, they don't get the social cues. They can't even read them. And so they live in a more a world where they can really shut themselves out from the outside world. And they have a tendency to become over-focused on, on certain subjects. And they, in fact, even have gifts. They're gifted in those subjects. And they become, or they are, introverts. Now, the reason why I found that topic really, really interesting, and if the person who wrote in the letter, I don't want to say who it is, if, you, uh, if you're listening, uh, this is for you. My husband, Danny, is, uh, has Asperger's as well. So he's on one end of the spectrum and I'm on the other. We are completely at polar opposites and we've taken tests, lots of tests, to actually diagnose that. We've read up on it, we've studied up on it, and we are both at the extreme opposite end. I score, like if, if I took an Asperger test, I would score lower than even normal people who don't have Asperger's. I score lower than that. When you score really low, it means you will score really high on a sensitivity test. So if I take a sensitivity empath test, I would score, I, I do score super high on that. Um, and Danny, the opposite, he scores super high on the Asperger's test, but really low on the test where it tests your boundaries and things because he has very strong boundaries. So again, I'd love to hear your questions about this subject if you're dealing 
with people who have this. So how have Danny and I um, been married for 22 years and why didn't I notice this before? How did we connect? I'm sure you have lots of questions like that as well. So when we first met, I never noticed that about him. He just seemed a little bit quirky, but it was endearing. You know, there was, I never noticed anything. And I did notice that he, he was a bit of a geek, a bit of a nerd. He's like really, really gifted with anything to do with technology, IT, that kind of stuff. So he can be pretty <laughs> nerdy, but I found it kind of cute and endearing. And it was only after, years after we got married, that I started noticing a lot of his um, obsessive compulsive tendencies. And he started noticing my lack of boundaries. And it really took, I think, from the point of me nearly dying to really learn that we have to embrace who we are. And we have both managed to embrace who we are and we talk about it really freely. We rarely, if ever, fight. And we work really well for each other because it's almost like um, having two ends of the spectrum we are so close, we, um, it's almost like one person being able to see two sides all the time. I mean, it's really great because I trust him more than I trust anybody on this planet. And I believe he feels the same way about me. He trusts me. He trusts me to use my intuition and my emotions to, um, to detect whatever I need to detect and tell him at the same time. He acts as my boundaries when I'm not able to. It's almost like, even, even though I say people with Asperger's um, seem to shut out the world, he seems to have me on the inside and his boundaries extend to beyond me. It's almost like he's taken me in as an extension of himself and it's like he shares his boundaries with me, which has really, really helped me, particularly in everything I do and and being out there in the world. And for those of you who don't know much about Asperger's and believe you may have it or someone in your family, I would suggest you look it up. There is a website called Asperger's.com. You can take the test for it. I suggest you look it up because when I started reading about it, it, made, it really helped me understand Danny a lot more. And I really mean a lot, lot more. And it helped me it helped us even to work together so much better. And when he started learning about being super sensitive and empaths, it helped him to understand me a lot more. So, um, so really, I would highly recommend that. And as I said, we rarely, if ever, fight. And what I want to do is, uh, and a lot of people ask me, what does Danny do? What does he do? So he basically takes care of all my IT needs and all my all the geeky needs basically and everything that needs detailed attention because the thing about people with Asperger's they're really good with details and um, I'm not and so he takes care of everything that needs super details so that I can just get on with doing what I do I love to do videos I love to write and I can get on with it and so I'm going to ask the two people if they have a question, but I would also love to ask Danny to come and show his face here since I've been speaking about him. Um, I'm sure the audience would love to see you. Come on, show your face for a moment. They, they always ask about you. Oh, and I know one other question they often ask. Hey, oh, come on in. You, you guys really want to see me? I'm, the camera will fog up, I'm sure. The, <laughs> the lens is probably fogging they up right now. They love you. They love you. Yeah, I'm not a hundred. Hi, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Mwah. Mwah. Um, okay, I'm going to go back and so, do, do my uh, Asperger's thing. <laughs> <laughs> Your nerdy thing. My nerdy thing. So, um, a lot of people ask how he managed to stay by my side. I wrote about this in Dying to Be Me, how I don't think I could have survived if it wasn't for him. Um, he was by my side through the illness and he never left me. I actually think that it's because of his Asperger's that he was able to stay so focused on helping me to heal. I know that when um, my best friend had cancer, I found it so hard to be by her side because when you are very thin-skinned, 
you feel the emotions and the pain of everyone around you. So you really need to take a lot of breaks. Someone with Asperger is actually, um, when they're really focused on something, they don't need to take a lot of breaks. Their boundaries, their emotional boundaries are so strong, they're not actually absorbing the emotions of other people. But they need to take breaks for a different reason. They take breaks because they don't understand the emotional cues. And I'm speaking for Danny at least. So he finds it hard to be around people who he doesn't know well because he can't read them and he doesn't understand them so he doesn't know them well. So it can be quite tiring trying to figure it all out. But at the same time, if there's an emergency, if there's an emergency and there's a fire or somebody's dying or somebody's sick, I would want someone with Asperger's to be, to be the one to help me because they're not going to uh, get drained or get sick by the detrimental situation that's happening around them. So they make the best firemen and the best emergency workers, um, the best emergency doctors, the best surgeons, uh, and the best IT people and the best accountants. So let's go towards the questions. And by the way, in case anyone hasn't noticed, I've got my Chinese New Year oranges here. Oranges always remind me of Wayne Dyer because he always had an orange on stage with him. Um, anybody got questions? No? I guess they're scrolling by too fast. You see, when my... <laughs> When Milena is here, she seems to capture them really well. And today, Milena is off doing other things because it's Sunday and uh, she does have a life. <laughs> I've got a couple. I've great. captured a couple. Oh, great. They're somewhat related. Um, Blanca Barbosa wrote, Why, if I read and look, at videos from people like you, I'm always trying to get rid of this feeling of sadness and and depression. I still can't find calm in my life or feel um, like I'm not worthy enough. What what can I do? Okay, so um, she feels so Blanca feels she's not worthy enough. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's a whole bunch of things uh, that that you can do. So my sense from her question is that she's not good at receiving. My sense from her question as well is because when you feel that you're not worthy enough, you kind of, uh, because you're trying to be worthy, we end up being people pleasers. Whenever we feel we're not worthy, we end up, we have a tendency to be a people pleaser and a doormat. And so we do and do and do for other people because we're trying to get them to um, make us feel worthy. We're trying to get it out of them. And when it's not forthcoming, we do even more, and then we feel drained, and then, uh, and when we feel drained, we kind of feel this little sort of depression or feel like giving up. So, number one, I would say to you, check your receiving channels. You're very, very good at giving, but it seems that you're not good at receiving. How do you open your receiving channels? you start by giving to yourself and don't feel guilty. When people give you gifts, accept it. Don't feel like you're obligated to return the gift. And I say this because somebody is giving you a gift because of something you have done. That's why they're giving you the gift. So accept it because they're giving it to you because of who you are. But when you accept it, of course show them your gratitude. But don't now feel guilty and feel you have to work at being worthy and deserving of having got that gift because you lose the gift if you do that. So accept the gift, smile graciously, be grateful, and make sure you spend time every day gifting yourself something, one act of kindness towards yourself every single day and get used to the universe giving gifts to you. Another thing I would say is even to journal, to write something in your journal every day that you feel the universe has presented you and get into the habit of receiving. And that should pr prop you up, that should energize you and make you feel a lot better and make you realize you are worthy and deserving of gifts from the universe. Uh, another question, Karen Crawford Stewart asks, how do you accept that you're spiritual enough when you're trying to be free from fear but still live with fear, anxiety, and depression? 
So when people live with fear, anxiety, depression, my sense from a question like that is that you are living a life that is not yours. It's a great question, so thank you for that, excuse me, for that question. And um, my sense is that it means you're living a life that is not your life. You've spent a lifetime trying to be what everyone else wants you to be and trying to please everyone else but also trying to be what everyone else wants you to be and every time we're trying to be what everyone else wants us to be um, you can't please everyone and we end up losing ourselves when we lose ourselves we realize that everything we're doing like maybe the the job we have is not something we would have taken if we were being who we are uh, we end up making all our choices from fear for example, you might take on a job because you're afraid a better one won't come along. You might hang out with people because you're afraid they won't think you're cool if you don't hang out with them. These are choices and decisions made from a place of fear. So what I'm going to say to you is think of all the decisions you make every single day and ask yourself, am I making these decisions out of fear or love? Decisions made out of love means you're making them because they bring you joy, because you're passionate about it. So in other words, um, am I at this job from a place of fear, fear of not having enough money, fear of a better job not coming along, or am I at this job because I'm passionate about this work and I love this work and it expresses who I am? Or am I part of this social circle and hanging out with these people because they reflect my beliefs and my values and, and I feel I'm with my tribe? Or am I with them because if I leave, they're going to judge me? You know, so these are the questions I want you to start asking yourself. And I want you to start making more choices from a place of love, a place of passion. It even includes like if you're eating healthy food. Am I eating all this healthy food and taking all these supplements because I love myself, I value myself, I want to live long um, because I want to be here for a while because I have lots to do? Or am I taking all this healthy food and these supplements because I'm afraid of illness? Be honest about these things with yourself. And then I want you to consciously make choices from a place of love, love, joy, passion, as opposed to fear and avoiding consequences. So I hope that's helpful for you um, because remember, love is the solution to every single problem in the world. Great, I think I have more questions, great. Saira Mian asks, how can empaths protect their energy? That's a great question. How can empaths or empaths protect their energy. Our accent is coming through there. <laughs> That's a great question and what's really interesting is my next book is all about being super sensitive. Um, and so the first thing I would do as an empath is I would ask myself what have I said yes to lately that I should have been saying no to? Because one of the biggest ways that empaths drain their energy is by this inability to say no. That's the, I would say for me, that was the biggest thing, an inability to say no. And the reason why we have this inability to say no is because we have very thin boundaries, maybe even no boundaries, between our own emotions and the emotions of others. So if we feel tired and drained, sure, we're aware we're tired and drained, but if somebody else is feeling like, oh my gosh, I desperately need this help, I need you to say, this, say yes to this for me, that emotion that they're feeling is equally strong, if not stronger to us, than our own emotion. There's no boundary between the two. So this is the thing with empaths. Being an empath is a, is a gift and, and a curse. It's a double-edged sword because on the one hand, empaths are really in touch with their inner guidance. They're in touch with the longing, with the universe's longings, and um, they're in touch with the secrets of the universe and why they came here. 
but they're also in touch with the noise of the outside world. And people just have to say to them something like, oh my gosh, you have to get out there and fight this battle and it's really important. And they will do that because they will feel obligated and sad and they will get dragged in and then they will, and they will start to drain their energy. So how do, we, um, how do we replenish our energy? How do we protect ourselves? Number one is by becoming realistic and embracing the fact that we have a tendency to do this. That's number one. Number two is to then start to say every day, what am I doing? What did I do today which I really didn't want to do but I couldn't say no? Start identifying these things. And I would like you to start learning to say no to things that, that actually drain you. Now, I know there are certain things in life that will drain you for which you have to do. There's no negotiation. I mean, maybe you have an aging parent who you have to go see regularly and care for. Maybe you have a special needs child. There are those things. And there's no negotiation. You have to be there for them. But the thing is, if you think of yourself as a smartphone, for example, who needs to recharge their batteries, when you have a lot of apps going on, your batteries drain faster. You have to recharge it more often. An empath has to think of themselves as someone who has a lot of apps going on. Someone on the other end of the spectrum is very good at turning off the apps that they're not using. An empath has too many apps going on, so they're getting drained all the time. They have way too many apps. They're being overwhelmed with turning on this app and that app and that app. So you have to start getting good at turning off the apps that are less um, meaningful, that are okay. Like for example, not going out um, to that event just because you didn't want to disappoint people. It's okay to say no. It's okay for people to see less of you, friends and people like that. It really is okay because they still love you. Um, empaths also mistake or get confused between love and approval. We do things because we're seeking approval, but we think that what we're doing is coming from a place of unconditional love. Now remember, people who love you unconditionally will love you even when you say no. Someone who loves you unconditionally will love you for who you are. Because if they're gonna stop loving you, when, uh, because someone who loves you unconditionally will want for you what you want for yourself. And if you're afraid of saying no because someone will stop loving you, then they don't love you unconditionally. Because, and if someone doesn't love you unconditionally, then it's not love. Because actually there's no such thing as, as conditional love, because then it's not love. And if you need to constantly be somebody else to seek approval, then that's not love, that's approval. Approval and love are two different things. So empaths need to see that differentiation and stop seeking approval. So, and I hope you found that helpful. And I think we're running out of time, if I'm not mistaken. So um, would that have been the last question? There is one more question. Okay. Which let's I think go might be very interesting. Yes, let's go with one more. And I apologize if I pronounce this person's name wrong. It's Kulsum, who asks, any advice for school teachers, teachers who feel overwhelmed and drained, drowning in expectations and worry? Gosh, that's a great question because school teachers are under a lot of pressure. And I don't know if that question came from America or another part of the world, but I know school teachers are under tremendous fear and pressure in America right now because of a lot of things that are going on and sadly a lot of things being politicized when they shouldn't be. It really should be about the well-being of our students and our teachers. So for a teacher, and this applies to any caregiver, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a mother, whether you're a caregiver in a hospital or a caregiver of somebody, uh, of, of sick people. You need to take care of yourself. You really need to put yourself first. You really do. And I don't care if people say that's selfish, but if you are depleted, if you are drained, if you are depressed, 
you will be even worse for the people around you. It is so important for the people around you, especially when you're shaping young lives, for them to be around somebody who is self-realized, self-actualized and whole. Because if you are depleted, if you are depressed, if you are needy, a needy person is someone who has a hole that needs to be filled by other people. If you are all those things and you bring yourself into the classroom with you, that is the energy you are sharing with everyone around you. Because remember, our very presence can share, our very presence can transform people. It's not just our words, but it's our presence because we're connected. You know that somebody can walk into a room and they can change the energy of the room. If they're full of joy, full of light, they will change the energy of the room and, and the whole room will suddenly feel uplifted and happy. And if they're depressed, they can also change the energy of the room, which is why it's so important for you to be happy. So the idea here, so what I'm saying here is the worst thing we can do is say, Teachers, you are responsible for all these young lives and so therefore you got to make sure you shape them right because they're going out in the world and they're not turning out right. You're putting more pressure on teachers when you do that and you're making them more fearful and then they are bringing that fear into the classroom. What we have to do is tell you teachers that you need to take time off to take care of yourself. You need to make time, and this is really, really important, even if it means taking a break from work. You need to regroup, recharge your batteries, um, spend time with your family, spend time doing what you love to do, follow your hobbies, spend time with loved ones, laugh, find your joy again, find your connection to the world again, find nice people to be around so that you get into that uplifting state and then bring that person with the bright light into the classroom. And it doesn't matter what you say or what you teach, it's the person you are. And that's what the kids get out of you because kids are really sensitive and kids will pick up the energies of the people around them. So, um, so, bright, so make your own light bright by making yourself happy, do what it takes to make yourself happy, and then bring that happy self out into the world. And this is why I say, love yourself like your life depends on it, because it does and it impacts everyone else, and, and take care of yourself first, find your joy, find your passion, shine your light as bright as you can, and then bring that joyful, brightly lit self out into the world and share it with everyone else. And if you think anything I said was um, useful or helpful for anyone you know, please feel free to share this video and join me on Hey House Radio on Wednesdays. And please send me your thoughts and comments. Check out my website. I'd love to hear from you through my website. And, um, and also I send out videos and newsletters every week. So if you'd like to get more like this, please sign up for my newsletter. Thank you so much for tuning in and I look forward to seeing you, hearing from you or welcoming you in my home next week. Have a great week. Bye.